for this night to be able to come before your sons and daughters and just bring a word to encourage, a word to, to set free, a word to juggle our minds and uh, put us directed towards you. Lord, we love you, we honor you, we praise you, we glorify you, and we magnify you. We know, God, that uh, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We bring this book of Ephesians, uh, that we know that we are built in Jesus Christ, that, that we have a weapon in Jesus Christ, that we can enter into his presence, and in his presence there's joy forevermore, that, that we don't have to sit and look at our past, because our future is better than our past. So I thank you, God, for what you're going to do. We love, honor, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you put up Ephesians 2, 14? Uh, uh, I have 14 through 21 is where I'm going to be coming from. Can you give me my phone? And we're talking about this in Ephesians uh we're kind of walking through the book of Ephesians this next year. On Saturdays, we're doing Galatians, and on Sunday, we're doing Ephesians. So right now, we're in Ephesians 2, and uh, I'm just going to be taking one segment of the text. Um, I usually put it in here. It looks like I'll be talking about Ephesians 2, verses 20 and uh, 21. I do have it down here. So I'll read this, this text, Ephesians 2, 20 and 21. So, then you are no longer strangers and aliens, outsiders without rights of citizenships, but you are fellow citizens and saints of God's saints, God's people, and are members of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as chief cornerstone, in whom the whole structure is joined together, and it continues to increase, growing into a holy temple in the Lord, consecrated, sanctuary, dedicated, set apart, sacred to the presence of God. So we're going to be talking about this portion of text, but before we can get to where we're built up, we have to understand where we may be broke down. Because sometimes we have to break down a foundation before we build it up. In other countries, they, they, they build. I went to Rome, and, and in Rome, they, they build on top of each other. They don't, like, strike, strike everything down. When you go to Israel and you look at the temple, you can look at the centuries that are underground because they don't tear it down. They just build on top of it. But we in America, we tear it down, and then we build on top of it. Not every nation does that. I think you guys still quote Ephesians and putting on the old pole armor of God every day, right? Yes. That's, that's when you're in a place that you can stand and begin to fight. But this first three chapters of Ephesians, the first thing you have to understand is you have to be seated with him first. And if you look at Ephesians, the first one through three, well, first three chapters, and we're right in this section right now in Ephesians 2, where you're seated with him. So you can't stand with him until you sit with him first. You have to spend time with him first before you start welding weapons and, and starting to put on all this armor and fighting, right? So the first three uh, uh, sections is talking about being seated with him. Just chill. Just chill. And then when you get to Ephesians 4, in the first part of Ephesians 6, it talks about you've got to walk with him. So we're going to be talking about that as we go throughout the year. How do you walk with Jesus? And then you get to the Ephesians 6 where everyone knows where now you're standing and I'm ready to fight. Right? So we got to get to the place first where we can just sit with him and enjoy sitting in his presence, sitting and knowing that he's there, sitting even when you're in trials and situations and turmoil, that you can just sit there and know that the weapons will form, but they won't prosper. But many times we want to go fight the thing instead of just sitting there and watch him fight your battles. Amen. So what is your belief system? And Ephesians 2 was talking about the divisions between Jews, the chosen people, and the Gentiles, the chosen people that were adopted. Yes. They're both chosen, but they're chosen out of different, different categories of being chosen. And they become uh, one. But how do you have any know taking two different things and becoming one is kind of hard. 
it, you know, take marriage. It's kind of hard to take two opposite people, one from Jupiter, one from Mars, and trying to bring them together to, into one. It's kind of hard. And that's what Jesus, Jesus is doing with these two people. Do we believe about your relationship? What do you believe about your, your relationship with Christ? Do you believe you're chosen? Yes. Yes. See, what are you chosen then? You believe you're chosen, but what are you chosen to do? Are you chosen to suffer? Are you just chosen just to go to heaven? Are you just, you know, you might have a religion that you get saved, die, and go to heaven. Is that your faith? No. Yeah, because there's something between you being saved and you dying. Many of us have 70, 80 years in between that time. And so what are you doing in between the time you're saved and the time you go to heaven? See, that's where your power has to come from. That's where your belief system needs to learn how to work. Because we know we're saved, we're going to heaven, great. But what about on earth? How are we going to walk? So the Jews believed they were special and they were above all people. They, because they had this relationship, they gave them the word. They, they had all these signs. They had all these wonders. They had all of these miracles. But then we also know that Jesus came not only for the Jews, but he came for the Gentiles. And so I'm going to tell you about these two types of people. And I want you to see yourselves in this little division that goes on. So the Jews, they, and this is the vision, they were chosen, but the Gentiles were adopted. Now in our society, if you're adopted, that's my adoptive brother, that's my half brother. We have this mentality, because you're adopted, you're somehow less. You see how that breakdown happens? But to God, you, you may think because you come out of this adoption system that you're not special. So you become this kind of split person that, yeah, they, they might have chose me out of the adoption system, but I'm not as special as the full brother or the full sister. I don't have all the rights. That's not how God acts. <laughs> you, you have all the rights as, as being adopted. You have all the rights that, that Jesus has. You have all the rights because you, even though you're adopted and you're grafted in, you still are a child of promise. That's right. You've got to understand that. But sometimes this, this fighting that goes on is, is your body and your flesh is fighting against your spirit. Your spirit is chosen, but your body is going back into the ground. And many times in all of our lives, when we started before we got saved, our body, our flesh controlled us. It wasn't the spirit until, until we became alive in Christ that the spirit man rose up and now you have this soul that has a body and has a spirit and now your soul don't know what to do. I know I'm chosen, but I also know I've sinned. And I know I'm adopted and I'm a child of God, but I also know what I am. <coughs> and the enemy's telling you who you are and those are the facts. And now you're not even looking at the spirit because you're looking at these facts. And so your belief system is I'm condemned. Even though you're adopted and you're free, you have this inheritance in the spirit. It's saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. Your body is like a teenager, more like a baby, saying, look at me. I want some candy. Look at me. I want some flesh. Look at me. I want some drugs. Look at me. I want to lie. Look at me. And we look at the wrong thing. This is the division. And then, because of this division, the Jews uh, were disobedient because they lived by the law. They had to follow the law to a T. And if they didn't follow the law, and they were disobedient to the law, they had all of these consequences. Well, the Gentiles lived by a world system. And they were disobedient, they were, they were disobedient to God. So in both instances, we are worldly today, and we disobey God. So you see, again, we have both cultures, both natures that we're walking by. And then the Jews, they wanted, the, they had the desires of their flesh. They began to yield to their fleshly nature. Well, of course, the Gentiles live by the lust of their nature. So we, nowadays, we give into our cravings of our flesh. What makes us any different then than the Jews and the Gentiles of the early days? It sounds like we're the same. The Jews were religious people. And they uh, were dead in sin because of their pride. And now the Gentiles were ignorant 
And so they were also dead in sin because of their ignorance. We can be ignorant because we don't want to read the word, we don't want to study the word, we don't want to walk the word because we want to live in this world system, come to church when they tell you to come to church, check off a box because you did it, you're no stronger in God, you're no, you're no, you're, you're, you haven't sat with God, you're just sitting in a pew so that you can say that I came to church today so I can get through this program so I can go back out the street and get high again. Mm. Ignorance. Ignorance. We stand in self-pride and we're ignorant to the truth. Amen. Is this a belief system that we have? When you think about these things, you're disobedient. Remember I told you your body that has a spirit, that has a soul. Well, in this soul, when you're disobedient, it's the will part of your soul that's bound. You don't want to do what you're supposed to do because you have this struggle in your will. And when you desire something in your flesh, your emotions get all involved. That's another part of your soul. And you can be emotionally involved. You can be emotionally tied to whatever it is you are. It can be a scent that kind of triggers something in your emotions and make you want to have it. And, then if, and if you're pride and ignorant, it's your mind. That's what your soul is, your will, your emotions, and your mind. And the enemy wants to bind all of those. So what is your belief system? Where are you bound? Are you just a rebel? I'm a rebel. I was born a rebel. You got a problem in your will. You need to get free. Maybe you're emotionally driven. And you're crying. You're sad. You cry in the drop of a hat. You're fearful. That's still in the emotional realm. And, and, and so you're bound in your emotions. And then you can have mental warfare. You just, your, your mind has already been triggered to how you're going to lose. Within each of our own bodies, we have this separation that happens. So we miss God. Remember I told you we're in a section where we want to sit with God. Well, how can you sit with God if you're torn in all of these places? Division. Religious or not religion, division because of class, division because of race, division because of circumstances. All of these things and all of these divisions have the ability to separate us from God. Where are you? Are you really seated in heavenly places? Or do you sit more in hell than you do in heaven? You're more tormented by the enemy than you are celebrating with God. Yet we raise our hands, Brian did an awesome <coughs> job, and the band did an awesome job of worship, and, 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 you, and you look like you were having fun, but really, you never really got a chance to enter in because the enemy's still talking about you. And you're just trying to scream louder than the voice is trying to talk, but you've never really exited and entered in to the secret place. I was in a worship service when I went to Indiana the last time I wasn't here, and Sharon preached. Uh, Paula said she did a good job, so praise God for that. We had a worship service, and when we were worshiping, the band stopped, the preaching stopped, the moving stopped. There was silence because the presence of God was there, and it was He was ministering to everything. There was total silence. And then once the spirit lifted, the preacher said, I'm not touching his glory. No. The band said, I'm not touching that glory. No. See, when you enter into the presence, you everything stops. Because he just passes by. And you just you just enter. And some people, I was on the back, some people had to leave because they couldn't even take the presence of God. And they were angry. Yeah. And they left. Yeah. Separation, bondage. What bondage do you have when you think about disobedience? Is it in your worth? You live by the law and rules and regulation, yet you disobey them. You, you feel like you're not worthy. Why? Because you look at the law, you know you're supposed to be holy, but you know that your mindset is not holy. And so therefore, you say, I'm not worthy to enter into the presence of God. I've done this, I've done this. Look, the Bible says I'm not supposed to do this. The Bible, and so therefore, I'm not worth to enter into his presence. That's your belief system. You strive for perfection. You struggle. And every time you try to strive for perfection, you trip and you fall. And it just clarifies that I'm not worthy to be like them. 
Who's them? The people that come up front, the people with the titles, the people, the people that seem to have arrived at, at excellence for some reason. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Any leader up here will tell you that we all got issues. And my issues got issues. And so we can still enter into a place with God, even with issues. Your outcome, when you feel that you're not worthy, the outcome of your life is yet your image has been stolen. If your image has been stolen, you can't walk in the authority of God because you haven't sat in the authority of God. Okay, maybe it's not worth. Maybe you're one that wanders. Remember that the Jews were wandering and searched for something, but never really finding it. So there's an emotional void. Maybe if I go to Gethsemane, I'll be free. Or maybe I'll go to Set Free and I'll be free. Maybe I'll go to this program and be free. Maybe I'll go to try a secular program. Yet you're wandering, looking for this freedom. And all they're trying to tell you here at Gethsemane is sit in the Word. Read the word, study the word, memorize the word. Not memorize the word so you can get a checkbox, but it, so it can get into your heart. Yeah. And so when it's in your heart and you get that situation, out of the heart flows the issues of life. Yeah. See, that's why they want you to memorize it so that it's in you. So that when you get into a, a hard situation, the anger doesn't come out. But the anointing comes out. Yeah. Don't you understand that you get anointed because you get into a press. Oil can only come out when it's pressed. And so that thing is coming up against you to get the oil out. And you're just bringing out the anger. And the anointing is bottled up. You're wandering. You're wandering. You, 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 be, you begin to, to have so many barriers that you, you don't move. You don't know where you belong. And instead of being dependent on God, we become codependent on people and programs. You do great when you're in Gethsemane. You step out of Gethsemane for five minutes and you're right back in the pit because you have this codependency. You should be dependent on God. That's their heart in the program. That's why they have, you have service every day. Now you're praying on Friday. So that your whole mind, attitude can change so that you can understand the presence of God and his wonder of God. He's trying to build a temple. Remember when they were wandering in the, in the wilderness, they would set up a temple, the glory of God would be there. I was reading this scripture. And, and when they were walking through the wilderness, the glory of God was telling them where to go. Dennis, tell me why did Moses then have a scout, a Moabite scout, to take him to the wilderness? He had a Moabite because the Moabites understood the wilderness, and they had him scout. And you have the presence of God telling you where to go, but you're not going to trust the presence of God. You're going to trust a man to say where you ought to go. I thought that was kind of jacked up. And that's what we do. The presence of God is telling it, I am a light and a path unto your, unto your feet. But instead of following the light, I think I would have followed Pauline because like, she can do those demons things. And she's a demon buster. I'm going to follow her. But you're wandering. You're looking for truth. You're looking for emotional stability. And God is like, here I am. I died for you. I, I got a perfect plan for you. So what we do in this when we replace our body and we replace it and never settle in one place, the outcome of this person is isolation. You don't know how to have a relationship because you isolate. I can do this myself. I got this. And isolation becomes your God. He said it in the beginning. It is not good for man to be alone. But yet we say, I got this. Somebody's lying. And I know it's not God. <laughs> What's your belief system? Because that becomes your bondage. And then the third one is walls. You live by your mind and your intellect. When we think about our mind, our mind is made up of our intellect and our imagination. And so we can get walls in our mind. They're actually called strongholds. Strongholds are something that you believe to be true, which are actually false. And it says in the word, you've got to cast down those vain imaginations because they're rising themselves up against the very knowledge of God. 
that you have to strike them down. Things that you see, things that you imagine, that the enemy begins to tap in into your resource. You may have a resource, for example, that God's given you a gift of dreams and visions. But the enemy will tap into that gift and he will show you demonic episodes of you dying. He will show you things in the spirit realm where you're getting ripped apart. And so your mind is saying, I don't want to see this. So you start doing drugs and then your, your mind begins to break down. And, and then there's a, the, 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 the wall that was supposed to be put up is now more open. And so instead of seeing more God, you're seeing more demons. Does that sound familiar? If it doesn't, that's good. But we get stuck on the rules, we get stuck on rituals, and we get stuck on reasoning. Surely, I have to do more than just repent to get into the presence of God. Surely, I have to do more than just, and, than just worship to enter into his presence. Surely, it has to be more than that. Your reasoning is your wall of separation. You get stuck. Jesus repealed the law so that by grace, you don't, you don't, your mind doesn't have to understand it. Your body doesn't have to understand it. All you have to do is receive it by faith. Faith is not about your understanding. It's about your reception. You have to receive it by faith. If your outcome, if you have these walls, is you will be institutionalized in systems and you will be bound by systems. Systems of operations will be your walls and you will never break out. And so Ephesians 2 gives us a couple uh, solutions and how to build you up. The first one is citizenship. It says there, uh, but you are a fellow citizens with saints of God's people. A citizen is a native or a naturalized person who owns a legal government is an entitled to protection. Do you actually understand when you're a citizen of the kingdom, you are entitled to being protected by God. That's part of his kingship. The protection is a part of it. God chose and called you into the kingdom and made you part of his household. Because you're part of his household, you come under his protection. Christ laid a foundation at the cross so that you could build on a firm foundation. But we don't want to build on that foundation because we want to build on our own foundation. The building material for citizens of God is this. Prayer. Study. Fellowship with the saints, the government of God. What's the government of God? Ephesians 4 and 11. The government of God is the apostle, the prophet, the, the evangelist, the teacher, and the pastor. That's called God's government. It was the last thing that God established when he went to heaven. He established a five-fold ministry, the government of God, for one purpose, to mature the saints for what? The work of the ministry. See, the truth of the matter is the government the pastors, the evangelists, they're not supposed to be the, the ones doing the work. You are. That's right. But you're so busy coming to the government because you lose to government systems taking care of you that you won't understand from the kingdom standpoint, you are supposed to be establishing the law. You are supposed to be establishing the system. You are supposed to do that, not the government. Amen. The government is to train you. Amen. Pastor is to train you. Teachers are to train you. Evangelists are to bring fish in here so that you yeah, the problem is you people don't eat them up. There's a rules that are out there as citizens. But are you building yourself up in prayer? How many of you, well, you probably will go to prayer on Friday because you might have to. But how many do you, will you enter prayer simply because you know that's how you can communicate to God? That's what prayer is. And uh, men, women too, but particularly men, should be praying a covering over their family. Even if you don't have a wife, you still have a family that you're waiting for someone to come. You should be praying a covering so that a piranha don't eat your wife that you don't even know you have yet. You should be in a practice of prayer. You should be in a practice of, of, of long suffering. You should be in a practice. And women, you should be praying so that the husband that you have, have will cover you and be the right person. There's plenty of us for us to pray about. That's right. We have a position in God, oh, yes. but we give it up because of our issues. And life becomes more important than the things of God. Citizenship, the second one it says in this text is consecration. The action of making or declaring something, typically a church sacred. Do you actually understand he declared you consecrated? 
When he separated you, he said that you were holy. He said that you were right. That's what consecration did. God is building you into his sanctuary. But we must be willing to dedicate and set ourselves apart for his presence. You are the temple. You are the bricks. The bricks that you're making for your temple to work is the prayer, is the, is the supplication, is the fasting. Those are the things that's making your temple stand. But we don't want to do that because it's too hard. We talked about that last night. Y'all lazy. Yeah. <laughs> Sanctuary is dedicated, set apart. It's sacred in the presence of God. You, we should be able to sit in the presence of God. Yeah. Hear him talk to him. Hear us. He'll hear him build us up. If you can't sit in the presence of God, how are you going to fight the enemy? You can't stand in the presence of the enemy if you can't even sit in the presence of God. Because it's God that said he's going to fight the battle. You must know that you have been given access because you've been chosen. You are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. But we're treating ourselves as if we're less, simply because of our issues. God can overcome. And then the third, citizen, consecration, and I'll close with chosen. Chosen by promise. Chosen by promise adoption. You have become a citizen and set apart of God. You have been chosen, and you have to proclaim it, because the promises of God's word says that I'm chosen. You have to begin to understand and you have to begin to proclaim, I am part of a royal priesthood. I am part of a salvation. I am part of the bride. You have to begin to understand who you are and whose you are and begin to proclaim it simply because you're chosen. You had nothing to do with your being chosen. That's right. It was declared. Right. It was declared righteous. You don't think that he's Okay, y'all think because you are in Gethsemane and y'all have issues, which we all have, that somehow that you're now discounted. That he made a mistake. I really didn't mean to choose him because now they're in Gethsemane and I can't choose him anymore. Do you actually think that? He knew the beginning from the end. He gave me this revelation. I was in the gym. And he says, I'm Alpha and Omega. Isn't that look right? He's the beginning and the end. Isn't that what we most likely say? We have this beginning and ending. If he's the same, he's Alpha and he's Omega. He's right there now. He's the beginning and the ending now. We only make space because we understand time. But God is eternal. There is no time. Right. Now you've been chosen. Now you have power. Now you are anointed. Now you can have more and more victory. It's now because everything in God is now. Everything in God is yes and amen. We're looking at this from a time perspective. You have to walk into it, but it's already been declared from the foundation of the world amen. that you have been chosen. You have been called more than a conqueror, but you've got to believe it and you've got to walk in it or else you'll be sitting in a den of demons. Being beat up when you are supposed to be the one beating the enemy out. Chosen. You have peace because of the promise of peace who is Jesus. We don't have peace because the enemy has torn us to pieces. But the chosen walk in peace. A peace that surpasses understanding. A peace, though, even in the storm, that you can say, it's all well. I consider it all joy. The chosen have power because they have the promised power of the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead is inside of you. How are you using it? How are you using the power? Are you, are you using the power? When the enemy comes in like a flood, it's a standard Lord supposed to be set, but are you setting it? Or are you just letting the enemy run all over you? If you know Jesus is Lord, you are children of promise. <coughs> Enter into his presence and begin to build the kingdom because you are the rocks Amen. to build Amen. that kingdom. If you are stirred and have the spirit of this, and, 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 and you have the spirit in your, in this, in your, in your uh, the Spirit of God has spoken to you from this word. You have got to understand that you are part of the promise, that you are consecrated. 
that you can draw closer and nearer to God. And because you want to draw nearer to God, you can enter into his presence. But you've got to believe it. You've got to believe that you are holy, righteous, and able to enter in. Father, I pray that they understand that they are part of rocks that's being built. Built in the kingdom, not their bondage. Yes, they were separated like the Jews and the Gentiles, but they, we are adopted and you graft us in and you're making us one in our spirit, in our bodies. And we have to become one in Christ Jesus. I pray whatever issue is hindering them from moving and living and having their being in you, that those walls and barriers would be broken down. I hope they understand. I pray they understand that, yes, weapons will form. But, God, you've never meant for those weapons to prosper. Because you said that we are more than a conqueror. I pray that we begin to conquer and understand that greater is he that is in us than he is in the world. We love you, we honor, and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.